Hello and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And this podcast is being recorded on the traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Mississauga people. I'm continuing to learn, and this is really important to me, so that I can learn about the culture of the Anishinaabe people who were here long before my settler ancestors on Turtle Island. And I'm really excited that I got to take part in a one-day training as a hike leader up here in the Bruce Peninsula, learning more about this land, learning more about the history of it in the colonization of our land here up in Ontario. I'm about three hours north of Toronto. And then really learning how I can continue to do this work. So that continues to be something that I'm doing. If you are learning something, I'd love to hear about that. And if you're new here, let me tell you a few other things. I'm a Canadian yoga teacher, mom of three, entrepreneur, and a forever student who loves to ask questions. And I'm not afraid to learn and have it be kind of messy. (laughs) So if you've been here for a while, you know that's how the things are going over here. And I love to hear feedback from you as well. If there's something that you're feeling like, oh, I'd love for you to cover this topic or I have this question or, hey, Shannon, I wonder if you haven't maybe learned this part of things. I'm really excited that you're here because we get to have conversations each and every week about yoga and running a business and life and how this all kind of ties in together and how we can pull in the philosophy of yoga into all of that as well. We've been doing a month of really talking about niche work and we're going to continue that today. And before we do, I want to say a huge thank you to Offering Tree. I use and love this software in my own business because it automates everything. Bookings, payments, Zoom links, reminders, and so much more. And we have a special podcast listener discount code if you're thinking about trying it out. You can find that over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Today's episode is also brought to you by Pelvic Health Professionals. This is a place where movement educators and healthcare professionals collaborate and learn the most up-to-date information regarding pelvic health. I'm super excited about a call that we're actually doing tomorrow. It's early November as I'm recording this for you because we do record our episodes ahead of time. We are doing a call with Diana, who we've had on the podcast. She's a PT and a yoga teacher, and we're going to talk about stress and the pelvic floor. And I have to tell you, as many of you know, if you've been here for a while and you've been listening to how things are going, I've been dealing with some some pretty big things, some pretty big grief in my own life. And then as well, the world right now has a lot of grief and trauma and stress And so I'm so looking forward to this call tomorrow because I think that yoga offers so much when we are dealing with tough things in life. I don't have to tell you that. You know that because you're a yoga teacher. If you would like to learn more about anything regarding pelvic health, specifically if you want to watch the replay of this call with Diana, you can check that out along with all of our other resources at pelvichealthprofessionals.com. This week, we're going to talk about a very niche specialty yoga that you might not have heard about before, water yoga. Krista Fairbrother is joining me on the podcast to talk about this variety, this variation of yoga that is not really known, but I've been following Krista's journey with this yoga for years. We've known each other for, I think, at least seven years online. We've never met in person yet, but we've had a lot of conversations and I've always wanted to learn a little bit more about water yoga, sometimes also called aqua yoga. And so I'm so excited that Krista gets to talk about that here and you all get to listen into the conversation. Krista is an internationally recognized aqua yoga teacher and trainer who makes yoga accessible through yoga in the water. She's passionate about helping people start an aqua yoga practice and she trains movement professionals to offer aqua yoga in their communities. Krista is also an internationally recognized expert in water yoga and a published author. Shout out to Krista and her publisher, Singing Dragon, for giving 
all of our listeners 20% off of Krista's book if you want to go and buy it. It's called Water Yoga. We'll put the code in the show notes for you. And I believe that the code might be valid until the end of 2023, but that might even go extend into January 2024. I needed to clarify that. I'd jump on it right away if you can. You can even, you know, reach out to Krista or reach out to Singing Dragon at some point and ask them, hey, when's this code good until or give it a try. If you're wanting a copy of the book, make sure to go to our show notes and use that link there with the discount code WY20. And you can find that over at our show notes. That's the connected yoga teacher.com slash 351. If you're busy and you don't have a chance to write anything down right now. In our conversation today, Krista is going to talk about her book. She's also going to explain what exactly water yoga is and how it's different from traditional yoga that's maybe done on land. One of the most common questions she gets is, how do you do downward dog in the water? She also talks about the science of immersion in water and the additional or different benefits that water yoga offers. Krista also talks about how water yoga can sometimes be more accessible to many people, especially those who are dealing with pain or who are concerned about their strength. This was such an interesting conversation to learn more about water yoga and how we can support people through different mediums to get the benefits of yoga. I'm excited to share it with you. So let's dive in, pun intended. (laughs) Let's dive into today's episode with Krista. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Krista. It's so great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. I'm excited that we get to talk about a real niche of yoga teaching. But first, before we get there, like tell our listeners where you're located, what's the work that you do, and who do you do it for? Sure. I'm on the West Coast of Florida in the United States, and I specialize in aqua yoga which like it sounds is yoga in the pool. And I work predominantly with seniors. I work a lot with people who have chronic pain and live with arthritis as well. I cannot remember when we first met. Do you remember when we first like got connected online? I think it was through, yeah, the podcast and your Facebook group that you manage. Right. And And it's been it's been years. <laughs> it has been years. It's been a long yeah. time. And I've been following yeah. your work and you've done so much now. Like you've written a book on aqua yoga. Like I remember way back when you were kind of doing these waterproof uh, handouts, which I thought was really cool. Yes, I still do those. So uh, last year I published a book called Water Yoga and it was published by Singing Dragon. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, I know it will happen after this podcast episode comes out, but uh, later this week, I actually am going to the Florida Writers Association Annual Conference because I'm a finalist for the Royal Palm Book Awards in the educational category. So that's very exciting. I don't know yet. I have a couple of days to wait. Um, It also won a silver medal in the Nautilus Book Awards. So I'm pretty proud of the fact it's a very good book to read. It's not just, you know, an aqua yoga study guide. It's it's entertaining even for a non-yoga audience. And then, yeah, those waterproof guides that I do, I still make those. And those are basically, if you want to practice in the pool and you take that book, you drop it in the water, it's not very durable. And I've actually sold, unfortunately, for those people, a couple copies of the book to people who've dropped it. And so the waterproof laminates are just such a more pool-friendly option to learn aqua yoga. So yeah, they're waterproof. They last in your pool bag for years and uh, they're real easy to flip through. That's so cool. So what got you started in teaching aqua yoga? Yeah. So I mentioned that I work mainly with seniors and a lot with arthritis and chronic pain and that journey of my own because I live with multiple autoimmune diseases is really integral to it. Because I like many yoga teachers you talk to, I went to yoga teacher training thinking, well, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to teach, you know, I want to do this for me. And in the middle of that process, I got a change in my diagnoses and realized I was in kind of much worse shape than I thought I had previously had to 
just a lupus diagnosis, systemic lupus erythematosus, which is a systemic autoimmune disease. Turns out I had multiple autoimmune diseases, a lot of bone erosions from rheumatoid arthritis. I was like, wow, I've been doing so many things. So I was a professional farrier for 10 years. I studied overseas. You know, I've done a lot and sort of the cognitive dissonance of how did I manage to do all that with these diseases is I really gave my yoga practice the credit because I started doing yoga when I was 20. So date myself here. It's like I have a 30 plus year yoga practice. And, and so it was that process that really inspired me to teach yoga in general, focus on working with people with arthritis. In pursuing that process, I met another yoga for arthritis teacher, and she just kind of casually mentioned, oh, we have like wine and yoga night at the pool on Saturday nights. And I I was like my eye, you know, like in the cartoons, if you matter, so, imagine somebody's eyes like bugging in and out. I was like, oh, my God, why has no one ever mentioned this? So I like immediately went to aqua yoga teacher training and fell in love with it. And that's been my thing ever since. So it was practice, it was like virtually immediate in my journey as a yoga teacher. Oh, that's really cool. And so when you tell people, yeah, I teach yoga, but I do it in the water. What are this, some of the common things that are said to you? Yeah. The, so the two most common questions, if anybody has any background with yoga, they'll say, oh, well, how do you do down dog? And then general people are more like, well, do you have to know how to swim? <laughs> so the two sort of answers for that is no, you don't have to know how to swim because it's head out water exercise. We work about mid chest height in the water. And then how do we do down dog? Is because most people don't want to get their hair wet in the pool. You know, maybe they just had a blowout or a color or, you know, they don't necessarily know how to swim. They want to keep their head out. And so our version of down dog in the pool is more like a wide leg forward fold. So you get the actions of the posture without necessarily recreating the shape exactly. And that is representative of how we adapt yoga to the pool in general, because not every shape is going to be the same. And not necessarily any of the other limbs of yoga are going to be able to be practiced in exactly the same manner. So we really try and honor the the tradition and the intent, but adapt it to the water environment. Now, you know, from following the podcast and following the Facebook group and knowing me, you know how much I talk about like niching down, find your niche, find your specialty. Yes. Was there ever a time where you were hesitant to choose this as your niche or was it just really easy to do? Yeah, that's a good question. It was very easy in terms of my passion, in terms of the difficulties of it is, I already mentioned, I have lupus. I am supposed to be very careful about being in the sun. I live in Florida. I teach outside at the pool. So I have to be really careful with covering up. Hence, I will post a lot of pictures of me in like full on sunwear with like a hat and a sun shirt and sun pants. And it's not necessarily what people associate with at the pool. You know, I'm not just slopping around doing aqua yoga in my bikini. Not that that, there's anything wrong with that. It's just, I got to stay out of the sun, you know? So knowing that in terms of that was a real trigger for my health, it was, you know, well, how do you manage your own health while being a teacher? And the sun is just one aspect of that. Many teachers have to face those decisions in terms of, you know, you're managing your own health with your career. So that was a, a barrier in that sense, as well as within the aquatics community, there isn't necessarily a lot of awareness about head out water exercise and the value of it. And that as a profession and it's sad to say that the pay rates are often even worse than that than for yoga. So it, that was a kind of hesitancy as in, you know, is that the route I want to go? And then thirdly, there's the, I get a lot of kind of pushback from some yoga people as to, well, is it even yoga? So I get lumped in a little bit sometimes like with goat yoga and naked yoga and get a lot of pushback about, well, this isn't even yoga. It's like, no, it very much is. You know, those little plastic rectangles were not invented thousands of years ago. You do not have to do yoga on one to call it yoga. <laughs> right. Yeah. So those are just three. Yeah. Three real examples that are there were definitely considerations. Right. And so you mentioned the value of it for people. What are the benefits of doing yoga in the water? 
in the water. A lot of it is tied specifically to the, the properties of water and the science of immersion. There has been no research done on aqua yoga. So all I can really reliably cite, I know you and I have connected through the pelvic health professionals membership as well. And so evidence-informed practice is really important. And so everything I'm going to give you based on, quote, science, all I can say is it's either been proven within the yoga research community or within aquatics research. So some other form of hydrotherapy, water therapy, aqua aerobics, that kind of thing. And and just unfortunately, we're not there yet on this specific dif- discipline. So it's a little bit of inference. But I can very reliably say, well, what does immersion do for you? Example, For example, when you get in the water, obviously you're dealing with buoyancy. <laughs> you just don't weigh as much, right? So the benefit of that is a lot of people who live with chronic pain or with arthritis, their joints are uncomfortable. And the fact that you suddenly don't weigh as much literally takes a load off, right? It also restores your healthy joint spaces. So as we age, you know, we all get a little shorter because we're gravity is not our friend. It doesn't increase the joint spaces. That would not be healthy, but it just restores that space we used to have because now we weigh a little less. So we have that opportunity to get a little taller, feel a little lighter, take a little bigger breath. So the buoyancy is really helpful for that. Then we have hydrostatic pressure. When you get in the water, you know how you feel almost like you're in a sock? It's You feel very like, wow, I'm very enveloped. And that's because the water is more dense than air. And it's it's the hydrostatic pressure is that increased density of the fluid and how it acts on your body. So it will reduce swelling. It moves more blood up into your torso. So, you, you know, your heart rate can slow, your blood pressure can go down, makes all your circulation easier. That hydrostatic pressure means your kidneys are cycling faster. You know how when you get in the pool and it's like, man, I got to pee. It is not just you. It is everyone <laughs> because of hydrostatic pressure, right? So that is just immersion. That's nothing about yoga. Again, it's just those signs of immersion and what the properties of the water do for us. So those are some really unique benefits that we get from aqua yoga, potentially, that we don't get from yoga on land. And then you think about the third one is the accessibility of aqua yoga. You don't have to get on and off the ground, which can be a real issue for people once you start to have trouble in your knees, um, your hips, perhaps in your wrists and hands. You know, we take it for granted that we can bear weight on our hands to go through those like down dogs and sun salutations. They're not necessarily accessible. A lot of people can no longer get their heart or, or excuse me, their head under their heart, you know, because that's going to increase their pressure, those kinds of things. So we don't have to do any of those in aqua yoga. You know, we're standing in the water and we're really trying to challenge our balance and our ability to ground more than we are trying to um, work through a flow or build a real dramatic strength through muscular effort. So those are three big things, that buoyancy, hydrostatic pressure, and then the accessibility factor. That's amazing. I can say like as someone who wasn't able to walk with a herniated disc, my physio team was like, whatever, however you can do it, get into a pool that's going to make all the difference for your mobility and mm-hmm. also like that like you're saying like make a little more space <laughs> helps with the buoyancy and the gravity if yes. someone ha- doesn't have an aqua yoga class in their community cuz i bet that's a lot of people but they yes. have access to a pool are there like three things that you'd suggest like try this bit of yoga in the pool yeah So if you have the experience with yoga, I would first off say, well, whatever poses you like, try those first, rather than me be prescriptive and say, oh, you should do X. Because whatever you can remember and do that, well, that's most important. Because many people, you know, they get in the pool, even if they have experience, whether it's aqua yoga or some other aquatics class, they'll get in the pool and they're like, I just can't remember what the teacher said, (laughs) right? The same thing as land practice. When people are trying to develop a personal practice, they're like, I can't remember what the teacher said. So number one is just do what works for you. <laughs> if, you if you're if you like, oh, I just kind of can't remember. Number two 
is any of the standing postures that you can manage to remember, those are going to be really effective in the water. Because again, it's that head out. So any of like your warrior postures, tree pose, those standing things. And then third, the other thing to think about is, all right, if if you're doing a posture that you are comfortable with in yoga, how can you engage in the water a little more with that posture? So for example, if you do just a regular yoga, or excuse me, warrior two, your arms are just on the surface of the water. And that represents that hands coming straight out of your arm sockets that we would do on land. But because you're in the water, what would happen if you maybe moved your arms through the water and challenged your leg muscles a little bit? Or perhaps we don't engage with the transverse plane very often in land yoga. So that's that parallel to the ground plane. So if you thought about, well, what if you moved your hands on the surface of the water horizontal a bit? And that's, so that's a different approach to how we might practice on land. So, so that's another opportunity there. Oh, that's so cool. I love it. I love that you're saying like, try some poses out and also modify them to play around in the water. Yeah. I'm popping in here for a moment, connected yoga teachers, because I would like to share a bit of a conversation that I recently had with Sarah Villamil. Shout out to Sarah, who's a yoga teacher from Calgary, Alberta, who uses Offering Tree. I thought it would be really nice if you could hear from Sarah and hear what her experience has been like using Offering Tree and working with that company. So here's a word from Sarah. I love how easy it is to get into touch with somebody from Offering Tree. I honestly feel like they're my friends. <laughs> um, maybe because I message them so often. I hope they feel the same way about me. I have questions for them all the time and they get back to me so quickly and so efficiently and really answer the question at hand. And it helps me improve my offering, helps me improve my communication with my clients. And I'm always constantly able to make these little tweaks and refine my website and what I'm able to um, present to my clients because of how accessible Offering Tree is. Their customer service is outstanding. I agree so much, Sarah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. It means so much to really have a company who's listening to you and who you can reach out to and they'll answer you right away. And that is definitely what I have found with Offering Tree. And I feel the same way as you. I feel like I know the names of the people who work over at Offering Tree and they also feel like friends for sure. If you are thinking about using Offering Tree, make sure to check out Sarah's website. It will give you an idea of how you can build an Offering Tree website and what it will look like. Sarah's done a great job. So that's over at sarahvillamill.com. We'll make sure to link to Sarah's website in the show notes. And if you do decide to sign up for Offering Tree, make sure to use our discount code. It's over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. We'll put all of this in the show notes because you're busy out there in the world doing all the things that you're doing. We get it. Now let's get back into our conversation with Krista Fairbrother. If people are interested in teaching aqua yoga, where would you send them? I would send them to me. (laughs) So I (laughs) offer certifications. Yeah, I offer certifications. I do online and I do in person. And I actually created an online program before COVID because I get so much interest from around the world. Like Australia has such an aquatics tradition, right? And has so many pools. So I really appreciate being able to work with people all around the world. And I've trained people in India, South America. So it's wonderful to see aqua yoga spreading around. Um, I've trained a couple teachers in Mauritius, the small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and they send beautiful pictures of their classes practicing out in the ocean. So it's, you know, just a beautiful thing. So I do those online programs and then in person as well, because different people have learning styles and the different abilities to travel. Yeah. Uh, and then where where does your book fit in then? Who is the book written for? Yes. So the book is written primarily for teachers because the publisher really does specialize in working with us as movement professionals. But I 
also tried to write the book in an accessible enough way that if you want to practice, you don't have a teacher near you, you could pick it up and still practice. So it has some complete done for you sequences. You know, you can just follow along to the poses. And so the other thing I try to tell people is when you, you know, when you have your own practice, you are your own first teacher. And so those ideas of, well, what would a teacher say to you? Well, those are the same things you say to yourself. So to pick up a teacher's guide actually can be easier than to pick up a how-to guide because it, it gives you a broader perspective of the, well, the things to look for for mistakes. A how-to guide also, it often isn't going to have that. But if you're just working with yourself, those are the kinds of things that are going to keep you from injury, injury because you're already getting advanced notice about those common trouble spots. What are some of the things that you see over the years with students uh, practicing in the pool in terms of like the benefits or the things that hold them back from coming to class? That's a good one. So the, the biggest, I'll actually flip my answer here. So the biggest barrier is either pool access because you know, not all communities have pools. So that's, that is a big barrier. But then the, also the barrier is fear of the water. And it's really important to acknowledge that because not a lot of people had swimming lessons. They might have had a traumatic experience, even if they got swim lessons. Um, I'm in the U S we have a, a strong, unfortunate history with discriminatory access towards pools. So who's allowed to use the pool and so there's this, there's a large percentage of the population that really has a fear of the water. So that can be the biggest barrier. The way I try to encourage people is to say, okay, well, it is head out. You don't have to get your head under the water. And I also have to give a shout out here to all the people who, despite having fear of the water, will come to aquatics classes. I've had people come to my classes and say, I don't know how to swim and I'm really scared of the water. And it's just like, take a second and acknowledge those people and bow down because never, ever when I have taught a land yoga class, have I any, had anybody come in and say, well, I'm afraid of the ground. So I've come to do your right. yoga class. But people right. who are afraid of the water will come to aquatics classes, which is just amazing. So we had kind of have to take that pause and acknowledge them and then make it accessible for them. Like maybe they want to work right by the wall or maybe they're going to use gear a little differently, or maybe they're going to move a little slower, or they're going to be in the front of the class so they can really hear you, you know, whatever that person needs to make them feel comfortable so that they will come back and, and improve their, their comfort level in the water. And I have had people start with head out water exercise. And after a couple of years, they're like, wow, you know, this, this is pretty nice. I think I am going to learn how to swim. So that's, that's a wonderful thing to see happen. So, so there's acknowledging that. And then um, the other question about you wanted to know about the other barriers for people who don't necessarily have those fears in the water, correct? Because where I'm thinking here is plank pose. And plank pose is one of those ones when you talk about like the benefits for people who continue to go and then the people who are new to it who might not think about what it is. So I work with many teachers who have, you know, they would say, I've spent thousands of hours in plank pose. I really know how to do a plank pose. And you give them two pool noodles because how are you going to do plank pose on the bottom of the pool? You can't, right? You are no longer doing plank pose on a stable surface. If you say, for example, you have two pool noodles, well, now the fact that you might be stronger on one hand, you're going to roll to that side of your body and continue to roll out of plank pose and roll out of plank pose. Or despite how many times you've had your teacher say you need to reach through your heels and engage your glutes, you're not doing it quite as much as you think you are, which is the water is really going to show you. So those are people who, you know, have some experience and what are they going to learn? They're going to learn some alternatives to practice. They're going to perhaps strengthen some areas that were weaker than they thought. And then people who've never done it for them, think about the body awareness for they're going to gain from that. So I work with, again, a lot of seniors, a lot of women of a certain age weren't even provided PE classes. So they don't necessarily have that experience with sports and, and kind of an organized way to move their bodies. So they're building so much body awareness, so much balance, because while if you do tree pose in the pool and you're standing on one leg, 
you might think, oh, well, the water's supporting me, but it's also pushing you around. <laughs> so you have to navigate the, the movement of the water. And, and I joke that if you fall over, the worst thing you're going to wound is your pride. But mm -hmm. it's still a big challenge to stand on one leg. So you're really building that stability and balance, muscular effort. It's just kind of the assumptions you bring to it, I think, is the difference. You know, who's more experienced versus less experienced and, and what your assumptions are. Do you teach group classes or one-on-one -on -one or both? I do both. Yeah. So I teach weekly group classes. And then I do at uh, in Florida, lots of people have backyard pools. So I'll do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. Or sometimes I'll even do, you know, small groups because then you could have a couple people in somebody's backyard pool. So, so the mix. Well, that's really cool. Uh, if someone is thinking about getting into this and so they can go online and check out your website, what do they need? Uh, like, do they need to be a 200 hour yoga teacher? And is there anything else that they need? Uh, so if you're going to work with me in the certification program, I ask that you're already a teacher because I don't teach somebody how to teach. I teach you the specifics of aqua yoga, but right. to, uh, to try to practice out, absolutely not. You need nothing. You just need access to a pool and whatever that pool requires for swimwear. So you can't go to the, the pool in your shorts and your cotton t-shirt because it's not good for water quality. That's why the pool won't let you do it. So all you need is a suit. That's really, don't, don't, uh, think you have to leap immediately to certification or that that this is only allowed for certain people or that kind of thing. So no, absolutely. And even if you are a yoga teacher, you don't have to leap to certification either. You can just take the yoga that you have and try it out in the pool and see what you learn. Very cool. Do you have to know how to swim to teach aqua yoga and or do you have to know how to like be a lifeguard? Lifeguard. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so if you are an aquatics professional doing aquatics classes, so that would be the case of aqua yoga, aqua aerobics, aqua zumba, anything. The idea is you are not a lifeguard because you are providing instruction. You can't do both safely. So ideally, when you're teaching, you have a lifeguard available to you. And that would be the case in virtually all municipal pools, white MCAs, Jewish community centers, you know, they have a real high safety bar. I have heard from fellow teachers that some of the smaller municipalities with cutbacks, you know, with COVID, municipal budgets have been strained. We actually have like worldwide lifeguard shortage because teenagers aren't working the same work habits as they used to. The pay scale is not what it was, you know, with inflation and everything. It's, it's tough to get lifeguards. And so you do not have to be a certified lifeguard to do it. But ideally, you have that lifeguard on deck to make the situation as safe as possible. Do you need to swim personally? No, because again, the idea is nobody's submerging. You can, if you choose to, do headstand, handstand. I've done aqua yoga with kids, of course, like scorpion pose. They love to do scorpion. You know, the kids are like, <laughs> let's do all the inversions. So it's not that you can't, I shouldn't say you, it's not that you can't do inversions. It's just adults don't want to. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's there is a higher safety bar involved in aqua yoga than there is in land yoga, obviously. But right. the idea is that you are an instructor. You are not a lifeguard the same way as a lifeguard shouldn't be expected to teach an aquatic class because they're there to be a lifeguard. Yeah, I would imagine that you work with a lot of yoga teachers who there is no one in their community doing aqua yoga. Absolutely. Yes, it's. The the number one people thing people say is, oh, you teach aqua yoga. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't even, I, I, no clue. Yes. So many of the people I work with, yeah, they're really kind of breaking down barriers. And I, I love to see that. It's, it's like the pebble, you know, that ripples out and aqua yoga goes out into the communities. That's really cool. Is there anything that you've learned along the way in terms of marketing this? Like, how do you get word out for your own business? How did you grow your classes? Yeah, that's a good question. The one of the, I think, biggest advantages of aqua yoga is it's really photogenic. Everybody loves to see those pictures of the pool on a warm, sunny day. It's just like, oh, I can see myself there. So there's, that is a really beautiful part of the practice. It's easy to get pictures that people want to see. And, and people can really see themselves doing it. So kind of leaning into 
we when we're I know you talk about marketing on the podcast, but it's not like we're trying to sell widgets here. We're not selling products. We're trying to help people reach an end result. They have a goal for themselves and we're trying to help them reach it. So if they want to be more relaxed and have fun, that picture in the pool really says that. So leaning into, you know, come to aqua yoga, have a good time, de-stress, bring some friends and, and get a little fit while you do it. That's what people can really see themselves doing. Yeah. Oh, this is fantastic. I'm excited um, for our connected yoga teachers to learn about this, to even think, oh yeah, that's a niche. And also you have a code for our listeners so that if they want to purchase your book, they can get a discount. Can you tell us yes. how, how we do that? Yes. We will make sure the code is in the show notes, but you can yeah. get the book directly from the publisher in the US or Canada and they'll give you a 20% discount. So if you're like, I want to try it out, that's a great opportunity. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited because then yoga teachers can check it out. Good luck with the book award. Also, Thank congratulations you. on like yeah. the year. How long have you been teaching aqua yoga? Sorry, I have to do some math. I think seven, <laughs> seven years, I think. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. That's that feels like a really long time for a yoga career and you've really built it up. I'm I'm just uh, excited to be able to see this journey along the way and to see you like figuring out so many things that people maybe haven't thought about. Like how do you take photos when you're doing a yoga pose and you're in the water? <laughs> oh yeah, the whole, we could do an entire podcast episode on water photography. I've really, and I have to give kudos to my partner here. So all the the well loved beleaguered yoga spouses out there who help you <laughs> because there is always somebody on the other side of that camera you know whether it's family member friend your spouse so thank you to all of them for helping me because and so my partner is the one on the other end of the camera and he's gotten very good at the no you need to move over cuz you're you don't have enough water and the which colors do you wear and what does the angle have to be in the weather and that could be an entire podcast episode <laughs> Water photography. <laughs> these are things that you were figuring out. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't know. Right. I don't know the and answer. these are the things you just figure out. I'm sure, you know, it's I, I in the past, I taught kids yoga, too. I used to do a lot of library yoga. And it's the same kind of thing. Well, how do you get photographs when you can't show the kids? Because, you know, you're not allowed to do that. Or if you do do the goat yoga, well, what do you do when you take the pictures and the goats go on duty? You know, what do you all these problems that we all face, you got to figure those out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you so much for sharing it out into the world and teaching other yoga teachers how to do that. And uh, thanks Thank for you. chatting with us today. Yeah. And thanks for having me. And thanks for all you do to make all this resources, information, support available to us in the yoga community. you so much, Krista. I learned so much about water yoga today and I kind of felt like I knew lots about it, but I love how you also brought the science in of how we can really find benefit of being in the water. I'm so curious, connected yoga teachers, if you try some yoga out the next time that you're in the pool or in some water, maybe you've already done that. Let us know in the show notes. That's over at the connected yoga teacher.com slash three, five, one. And also let me know if you've had a time where you felt like water was really the healing place to be, or if you have some kind of a connection to water, I'd love to read that in the comments. You can also send a voicemail. I love to hear from you. That's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com. There's a voicemail button on our website. It allows you to leave a 90 second voice message. You can leave multiple ones. I end up doing that. I end up talking for a long time on voice messages. <laughs> also, if you have not already left a review for the podcast, please go do that. Share it with a yoga teacher friend. Maybe share this episode with someone who likes to hang out in the pool. Maybe share it with a yoga teacher who lives in a community where they're trying to find kind of a niche type of yoga. It's a big gift when you share the podcast, when you leave a review, and also when you're subscribed to it so that you don't miss an episode. 
I want to tell you about a really exciting call that we have coming up. And I've actually just confirmed some dates as well for our next yoga series. So in December, inside of Pelvic Health Professionals, we're going to have a talk with Tyla Arneson, who we recently had on the podcast. And many of you told us we want to hear more about this. So we talked to Tyla about yoga for people in the cancer community. Tyla is going to come into our membership, which you can join if you'd like to just for this call, just for that month if you want, or you can stay in there and learn. We're going to learn all about pelvic health and cancer in December. It's actually December the 4th if you want to mark it on your calendar. There will be a replay. If you're listening to this after that date, you can still check that out. And then in January, we're going to do a six-week series with Tyla specifically focused on yoga for people who are dealing with pelvic cancer. So if you work with any population that might be dealing with cancer, which is a lot of people, we know that 40 some percent of people deal with a cancer diagnosis at some point in their life. That's a lot of our students. Or if you know someone who's dealing with pelvic cancer right now, this is an amazing series to tell them about. So you can find all of the information for this over at pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Now I'm reminding myself that I need to get that yoga page up there. (laughs) I think I'll have it up by the time you have a listen to this episode. And don't worry, Crunch is going to remind me when she goes to do the show notes that if I'm missing that link, she will tell me. Oh, I need to give a special shout out to Crunch actually because she told me that I should use that pun of like, let's dive in for this episode. And I just want to say it's really fun to like sometimes read notes when we're getting podcast episodes ready for you. Fun notes like that. So that joke is all on crunch. (laughs) Sorry, crunch, if you didn't want me to tell people. Thank you also to Suzanne and Sinead on our team for the work that they do in this world. I am super grateful for them. I'm also super grateful for you, dear listener. You are here right until the end. I am so, so honored that you hung out today and had a listen to the podcast. If you've been listening for a while, I'm so amazed that you are still hanging out here because we are at episode 351. I feel like I'm planning out the next year and looking at my calendar and thinking, wow, We are really still clipping along doing this thing here together and it's because of you. If you are feeling like you need a supportive community of yoga teachers, we have a free Facebook group. I'm not sure if you're in it already. There are over 12,000 yoga teachers from around the world. I'm amazed by this community. If you post a question in there, you are going to get some help in there for sure. Uh, You can check that out from our website over at theconnectedyogateacher.com. There's a button right there on the homepage about our Facebook group. Next week on the podcast, I am going to be talking about niche work again. This time I'm answering your questions. And if you have more questions about niching down, please send them over. You can send them through our website. You'll find our email there, I think. (laughs) You can sign up for our email and reply to that, or you can send me a direct email at shannon at theconnectedyogateacher.com, or you can leave a voice message, or you can tag me in a Facebook post, or you can private message me on Instagram. Get your question to me in whatever way about how to specialize, how to niche down, I'm here for it. I really would like to keep talking about this and keep highlighting some yoga teachers who are doing that, who are niching down and really finding the benefit of that. And if you are having trouble niching down, you can also find on our website where I did open consultation calls again. So check that out. And I want to tell you, As a podcast listener, if you ever hit a point in your business where you think, wow, I cannot afford that consultation call with Shannon, I'm telling you right now, reach out to me and let's figure out how you can because that is my goal to help and support you in whatever way I can. And if it feels like my prices are not accessible, please reach out and tell me uh, what price is accessible for you. I really, that's something that's really important to me. Okay, I'm ready to close out today's podcast episode. 
I am feeling like more than ever in this month, in this time when I am talking with you, it is so important that we keep connections going, that we keep connections with ourselves and our community around us. I really think that's the key right now. Many of you will know that in the news, there is some heavy, heavy stuff where I think we as a global community can work harder for peace right now. I really think we can. And we can keep standing up and saying, I want peace for everyone, for every single person. I don't want to say I'm okay with anything less than peace. (laughs) So if you're up for that and you're also feeling like things are getting you down right now, please know that you are not alone. And let's dig into this question this week to really see if we can find that inner peace that then we can spread out into the world. So I would like to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. 